So there are patterns in the periodic table. Uh, Dmitry Mendeleev is often given credit for developing the modern periodic table. And this happened back in 1869. He observed that certain groups of elements had similar properties. Oh, well, these, you know, these three elements react with oxygen in the same way. And these things form the same kind of ions. Um, at that point, it was just kind of a jumble of a bunch of different elements. There was no periodic table. So he found that if you put the order, the elements in order of increasing mass, that those period, uh, too many P words, those properties recurred in a periodic pattern. Periodic means to exhibit a repeating pattern. So he summarized these observations in what's called the periodic law. When the elements are arranged in order of increasing mass, certain sets of properties recur periodically. So we can look at it this way. So here are elements 1 through 20. And put in order of increasing mass, element 1, element 9, and element 17 have some common properties. It's a little bit like keys on a piano keyboard. There's middle C, and then an octave above is another C. It's a harmonic, right? So here's helium. Helium is very unreactive. It's a gas at room temperature. And over here, neon is also unreactive and a gas. And then over here, argon, also an unreactive gas. So there were these recurring properties. So instead of having this one long list, he made a table. And so this is a very simple periodic table showing just those first 20 elements. Um, just ignore hydrogen for now. And we see here two, three, four, etc. You go in order, and now all the green ones line up and the orange ones, etc. Um, hydrogen, I think of him as like the baby, baby brother of the family, kind of like my youngest, Andrew. And the youngest kid gets away with stuff that the other kids didn't get away with, right? Because mom and dad are old and tired, and they just don't care that much anymore, right? So helium is that baby brother, and we're going to see that he breaks a lot of the rules. He's an exception. So in some ways, he belongs over here, but in other ways, he belongs over there. And some, some periodic tables will actually show him in both places. So we just have to make allowances for hydrogen. The table that Mendeleev made had some gaps in it because there were elements that had not yet been discovered. And he predicted that new elements would be discovered. He left holes in the table. And he even predicted what their properties were. It's pretty amazing. So he predicted that an element that he called echa silicon would be discovered. Echa means below. And so this was the element directly below silicon. And sure enough, in 1886, it was discovered uh, by a German chemist who named it germanium. How was he able to predict? That's a good question. So he was able to predict the existence of it because when he lined up the elements by their properties, oh, there, was, there, there was were gaps. Okay. And then what he did is he looked at the properties of the elements on each side and the elements on the top and the bottom, and he was able to predict things like density and melting point and reactivity. Um, just based on the things around it. So this is just sort of interesting. This shows um, in, in just blocks of time when these elements were discovered. Um, and this is a little bit out of date because we now have elements in here as well. All of these uh, yellow ones um, are radioactive. They're actually man-made elements. It's kind of interesting. And this is how, in 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev completed the first periodic table. It's a joke. Tetris? Yeah. OK. I should really take that one out. It just never gets a good reaction. OK, so the modern periodic table, instead of putting them in order of mass, we put them in order of increasing atomic number. Mendeleev didn't know about protons. 
So he just went by the mass of, of the substance. Um, and we have more elements now because more have been discovered and some have been created. If we look at the periodic table closely, we'll see that there are at least two places where increasing mass disagrees with increasing atomic number. So if we look, um, I think it's copper, no, it's nickel and cobalt. So the atomic mass of nickel is lower than that of cobalt, but nickel has more protons. And the reason for that is that nickel has more neutrons. And so that makes, um, I'm sorry, cobalt has more neutrons, and so it makes it heavier than nickel, even though it has fewer protons. Mendeleev observed that there were a couple of places where the mass didn't line up with the properties, and so he tweaked those. Um, it was later that we discovered that the correct ordering principle is atomic number, number of protons. There's a lot of information hiding in the periodic table. Um, this slide shows major divisions. So on this slide we see that there's this dark line, sort of a stair-step line going diagonally. And that's also on the periodic table here. We put it on there with blue tape because it wasn't there and we like it. That's the line separating metals and nonmetals. So to the left of that line are the metals. And to the right are the nonmetals. And then the elements that are right along that, kind of in no man's land, those are semi-metals or metalloids. They are kind of like metals, but they're kind of like non-metals too. So you should be able to identify whether it's a metal, a non-metal, or a semi-metal just by finding it on the periodic table. If you forget which is which in terms of is this group metals or non-metals, we'll find something that you know something about. Helium. We put that in balloons. Is that a metal? No, that's silly. It must not be a metal. It's a non-metal. So then this side is non-metals and those are the metals. Um, the the semi-metals, um, if you remember everything that's touching the line except for aluminum, polonium is also a metal, but I'm not going to mess with that one. Uh, aluminum we should recognize is a metal. I have a can here that's made out of aluminum. It's obviously metal. All those others that are adjacent to that line are semi-metals. We also have, um, there are rows in the periodic table. We call those periods, and those are numbered one through seven. Um, we have groups in the periodic table. So those are the columns. So this one is group 1A, also known as group one group 2A or group 2, uh, there's two sets of numbering. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry has decided that they would prefer to just number the columns 1 through 18. So fine, they, they decided to do that. But in the United States, you know, we kind of are a little bit rebellious against things like the metric system. Um, and so we, we keep using this other older system. So here we have the main group elements um, 1A, 2A, and then over here, 3A through 8A. And these guys in the middle here have numbers with Bs. Personally, I don't think these numbers are very useful at all, but the A numbers are very useful. And so I tend to use those a lot. They are on the periodic table on the wall. They will be on the periodic table that I give you for an exam as well. <coughs> So metals, non-metals, metalloids, here's a list of some of the common properties. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. They're malleable, which means that you can hammer them into a sheet. If you take a piece of metal and hit it with a sledgehammer, it's not going to shatter. It's going to dent, right? And if you keep denting it, you can change its shape. That's malleability. Ductile means it can be drawn into a wire. Most metals are shiny. And probably the most important characteristic for chemistry is they tend to lose electrons when they undergo chemical changes. So if it's losing electrons, is it going to be a cation or an anion? 
It would be a cation. It's losing negative charges, so it becomes a cation. The nonmetals are kind of opposite. They're not good conductors. They're not ductile. They're not malleable. And they gain electrons. So they're just kind of opposite of each other. And then the metalloids are semi-metals, also called semiconductors. They're kind of in the middle. They conduct a little bit, but not as well as the metals do. Any questions? Metals form cations. Yep. So metals form cations, and nonmetals form anions. So nonmetal starts with an N, negative starts with an N, nonmetals make negative ions. I got ahead of myself earlier, that's okay. Now it's a review. Anions for nonmetals. Mm -hmm. So here's another version of a periodic table. So here the periods are identified, and then we have the group numbers going across. What's shaded in yellow here, the parts of the periodic table that stick up higher, those are the main group elements. And these are the transition elements in the middle. So I think of this as being like two banks of a river, and, and here's the river in between. It's the transition from one side to the other side. Main group elements have more predictable properties, and the transition metals tend to be less predictable. Some of those groups have special names. All of the elements in a group are going to have some similar properties. Some of these groups are important enough that they actually have names. So the noble gases are in group 8A. They are unreactive. Some of them um, do not form any known compounds. The alkali metals at the other side of the periodic table, group 1A, are very reactive, and those are all metals. Alkaline earth metals are group 2A. They're fairly reactive, but not as much as the alkali metals. And then next to the noble gases, we have the halogens, group 7A. And those are very reactive nonmetals. So if I ask you what the third period halogen is, you should be able to look at a periodic table and tell me. Halogens are group 7A. The third period is the third row, so that would be chlorine. So the alkaline earth metals are more reactive than the, than the alkali? No, the alkali metals are the most reactive. Most reactive. Alkaline earth are not as reactive. So we're going to learn how to predict the charges of ions based on position. Not at all. So main group metals tend to lose electrons. And they're going to form a cation that has the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. Some of this is not going to make a whole lot of sense, and then it'll all come together in a couple slides. A main group nonmetal tends to gain electrons, making a negative ion, an anion that has the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. So in general, the alkali metals, those guys in group 1A, tend to lose one electron. So then they're going to form plus one ions, or one plus ions. Alkaline earth in group 2A tend to lose two electrons. Um, so group 1A forms a one plus, group 2A forms a two plus. The halogens tend to gain one electron. The oxygen family, I don't know why that one doesn't have a name, uh, group 6 tends to gain two electrons, and so forms two minus ions. Um, I really need to move the periodic table closer to the beginning of this. I'll go back to that other slide. We really need this picture here. So over here, these are the group 1A elements. Um, hydrogen is not technically an alkali metal because it's not a metal, but he's sitting over there because he behaves like one sometimes. 
and hydrogen is not technically a halogen, but he's over here as well because sometimes he acts like one. Again, baby brother, we just let him get away with stuff like that. Okay, so. 7A was uh, loses one electron? Seven, group 7A seven, gains, gains one electron. And 6A so, gains two? Yeah, so let's look at fluorine. And the, there's a noble gas right next to fluorine that would be neon, right? How many electrons does neon have? Ten. It has ten protons and ten electrons. A neutral atom of fluorine has nine protons and nine electrons. There's something kind of magical about having ten electrons. We'll learn later more than you ever wanted to know about why that is. But for now, we're just going to say everybody wants to be like a noble gas. So here's fluorine with nine electrons, but he wants to be like neon with 10 electrons. So he's gonna react in a way that he can gain an electron. When he gains one electron, now he has a negative one charge. For oxygen to have the same number of electrons as neon, she needs to gain two electrons, right? Because oxygen has eight protons and eight electrons. Nitrogen has seven protons and seven electrons needs to gain three electrons to be like neon, okay? Now, if we go past neon, neon's number 10, sodium is element number 11. Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. Sodium also would like to have 10 electrons because it's like special. So losing an electron is the easiest way to get there, so sodium forms a plus one ion. And there's magnesium, element number 12, the easiest way for magnesium to become like a noble gas is to lose two electrons. Forms a plus two ion. And that is why all of the 2A metals form plus two ions. Because in doing so, they have the same number of electrons as the next smallest noble gas. All of the halogens gain one electron because then they have the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. Does that make sense? I think of, yeah, go ahead. So in the fourth column, where it starts with carbon. Um, yeah, what about carbon? So those by themselves, they were saying in the tutorial center, unless they're linked with something else, you don't really know what their charge is. Is that after that? So what about carbon? Carbon is right here. Carbon actually just doesn't form ions in the same way that nitrogen does. Um, and the, it kind of makes sense in our simplistic understanding here in order for carbon to have the same number of electrons as neon, it would have to gain four electrons, or to become like helium, it would have to lose four. It's kind of stuck in the middle, right? It's just stuck in the middle. It's like too hard either way. And so the group 4A elements, the nonmetals at least, they just don't form ions. Now, if you don't remember that, it's okay, because they're just never gonna come up where we need to predict ion charges. Boron kind of does the same thing? Um, yeah, boron doesn't, doesn't really do ions either. Um, so what, what we need to be able to do is to predict these following a pattern. And we could predict charges for things that don't actually happen, but we're not going to get into any trouble for that. I think of electrons as being like the clothing of an atom and the protons are the personality or the soul, right? And you can't change who you are, but you can change what you look like, right? You can get your hair cut, you can buy a new jacket, whatever. So atoms can gain or lose electrons to change what they look like. So I think of the noble gases as being that in-group, the cool kids in high school, right? That everybody wanted to be like. And you can't necessarily become one of them, but you can look like one, right? So the, the halogens here can't become a noble gas, but they can look like one on the outside by gaining an electron. Okay. Yes? So why are these certain elements highlighted in this? Case? That's an excellent Sorry. question. So why, why are only some of these highlighted? These are the elements that form predictable charged ions. So elements that form ions with predictable charges. Um, so aluminum is here 
Aluminum is in group 3A and it's a metal. It forms a plus 3 ion. So would boron be the same thing? It would be a plus 3? So, yeah, so what about boron? Boron is here. Um, boron is a semi-metal. And so when we're, when we're talking about naming things, uh, what do we do with the semi-metals? I've not seen this written anywhere, but it seems to work out that for the semi-metals, you look at what side of the line is the semi-metal on. So boron is on the non-metal side. So when we have to apply rules to it, we're going to apply non-metal rules. And these guys down here are on the metal side, so we're going to treat them like metals. So if you were forced to predict a charge for boron, I'd say go with minus 5. It doesn't actually form ions, though. All of these other elements, um, especially these guys, they all form ions, but their charges are not predictable from the periodic table. And we'll talk more about those in chapter three. So let's go back to this slide that I skipped. So for the main group elements that form cations, those are the non-metals. I'm sorry, the metals. The metals are cations. The charge is equal to the group number. So that's group 1A, group 2A, group 3A. The charge is equal to the group number. For the main group elements that form anions, those are nonmetals, the charge is equal to the group number minus 8. Some students like that, others don't. Uh, you can also just count backwards. I'll show you that in a minute. Then the transition elements can form various ions with different charges. So let's practice. Predict the charges of the monoatomic ions formed by these main group elements. So N. First thing is find it on the periodic table. Well, it's over here. Is it a metal or a nonmetal? It's a nonmetal, so what is its charge going to be, positive or negative? Negative. Okay, so we know it's going to be negative. Um, you can take its group number, group number 5, and subtract 8. You get minus 3. Um, or you can say, well, let's pretend we're playing a board game and we're starting over here and we're counting backwards. Because going to the left is backwards, right? That's negative. So this is 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. It's got a negative 3 charge. So we would write that, write the element symbol, write the magnitude of the charge, and then the sign. We don't want it to look like something raised to the negative 3 power. It's n3 minus. Let's do Rb, rubidium. So that's down here. After a while, you'll remember where the common elements are, and it won't take so long. Metal or non-metal? It's a metal. So is it going to have a positive charge or a negative charge? Positive. positive. Okay, are you sure about that? Yeah, yeah you're positive. Um, so what's its charge? Positive. positive one, because it's in group 1A. So if we write the symbol for it, the element symbol, and plus. So you can only subtract eight from the anion. Right, right. It, that doesn't work with the cations. Right, so for charges, you always write the sign. And if there's a one, you can leave it off. And the number goes before the sign. So it's like exactly backwards of math. I think intentionally, because we want it to look different. We would not want uh, n minus 3 and have someone think that's a variable n raised to the negative third power. We want to be clear this is an ion. Yes? Pardon me? Why, why are these very reactive with water? Th that I can't really explain that yet. So that's, we have to learn a little more chemistry before we can do that. They, they form ions very easily. Uh, they're very reactive. Um, and we'll see why later.